Hello and welcome to another episode of The Halal Gap. I'm your host, Sophia Elani, and today we have a special episode recording of the panel discussion from our opening credits event on March 11, 2022. This evening of connection and discussion was the kickoff to our festival weekend with over 250 guests in attendance from around the world. This event was made possible by our partners at In Spirit Foundation. Our amazing panel featured award-winning writer and director whose credits include 13 Reasons Why, The Bold Type, and Rami, Sahar Jahani, Canadian Screen Award-winning actor and star of CTV's The Transplant, Hamza Huck, writer, filmmaker, and creator of Little Mosque on the Prairie, Zarka Nawaz, and the 16th Government Film Commissioner and Chairperson of the National Film Board of Canada, Claude Jolicoeur. Let's join my co-host, Sikandar Atik. Take it away. So let's let's jump into it. And today, by the way, the intention is to have a conversation, right? It's not meant to be an interview. Please feel free to jump in whenever if there's something that you think resonates with you. Uh, we will be opening the floor up to questions afterwards as well. So please do keep that in mind if there's things that come up that you guys would like further uh, to, to dive into further. Um, I, I want to start with this idea of representation. You know, we've, we've invited a number of groups here today who represent what we like to call gatekeepers, right? Uh, these are institutions like studios, producers, uh, you know, people who could pave the path for new creatives. Um, so why should they care? Why is representation something that should matter to someone like Claude or some other organization? And Zarka, I know you recently wrote an article about exactly this, so maybe we'll start with your perspective. Well, I mean, representation is measurable. I remember getting a call from CNN and they were asking me how I felt about this study that had been done. A control group watched episodes of Little Mosque on the Prairie. Another control group watched Friends and then they measured impl implicit and explicit bias against Muslims. And lo and behold, it came down for the group that watched Little Mosque and unsurprisingly remained the same for those who watched Friends. And so that was very telling that if you, for a lot of Americans particularly, the only Muslims they're ever gonna meet might be on a television. And if that is the only person that you're ever gonna meet, that image matters because that will change how you feel about an entire community because up to that point the only Muslims they've seen are new the ones on the news the terrorists the, who, those who are violent who commit acts you know violence against other people I mean the man who shot six Muslims in the Quebec City mosque in 20 was it 2013 I'm getting my terrorist incidents mixed up 2016 <laughs> sorry there's so many now, I can't keep track. He said, he, when, when the police interrogated him, he said, I was trying to save Canadians from Muslims because he had seen so many images of violent Muslims on television. And when he heard that the prime minister was going to allow more refugees from Syria into the country, he was scared and he was trying to protect his community. It has real life implications for us on the ground. And so that's the point I wanted to make when I wrote the article that these things matter. Yeah. And, you know, 15 years ago when, when Little Mosque on the Prairie and the Moskers was just starting out, I think, as you mentioned, so much of what we were fighting for was just to be seen on screen, right, as something other than a terrorist. And, um, you know, the Pillars Fund, our, our friends at the Pillars Fund, as we've, we've got some stats over here, have shown that we still have quite a ways to go to get out of the background. And Hamza, I remember you saying uh, in a previous conversation that the point of transplant was really to follow a side character home, right? So someone who would typically be considered just another background character, bringing that person into the spotlight. So why do you think like this nuanced representation, bringing these side characters to the forefront is so important? Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just think that like, it's so limited in terms of, in terms of like, when we actually get to be seen on camera, that we only get a certain amount of time to either show that we're villains or victims. There's no in between. And like to actually get the time to see somebody as a well-rounded, actual human person 
who is going through very universal things from a unique point of view and to offer that point of view to an audience that hasn't uh, like seen it before or experienced it before, I feel grateful to be a part of that show that is at least making an attempt to show a Muslim character as a well-rounded actual person and as opposed to like, okay, cool, like this guest star comes in and he's the abusive father and then like, you know, his daughter's the one who feels oppressed by Islam and she just wants to date the white guy. You know what I mean? Like, and, that, and, and you get like the polar opposites, but there's not like the gray area in between. Like I think the responsibility is on us as well because we only want to show our virtues as opposed to our bullshit and we got bullshit. So like, you know, like I think I think to get an opportunity to do that on a large scale and to do it for a prolonged period of time is just, hopefully it will affect the way other shows and other media will, will approach it. That was a sentence. I think it worked. It had a verb. I think you're good. Um, that, that brings a, up a good point. I mean, you know, we, we've, we've got this display on the other side of what we call Muslim facepalm moments, which is basically like you were talking about these representations of Muslims currently in programming where it is one of those crazy extremes, right? And I'm wondering, Sarah, I'd, I'd like your perspective on this. How, how much of that is due to the fact that there's a lack of representation within specifically the writer's room, right? Where it comes with, you know, having Muslim voice tell the stories why, rather than, you know, what's been called the Muslim story through the white gaze. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'll give you a number. This is from the Writers Guild of America. There are only 2% two per, two of the writers in all of the Writers Guild, which is Writers Guild East and West. It's like all of America. I don't know if in Canada it's the same guild, but sorry, less than 2% of those writers are of Middle Eastern background. And of course we know that Muslims are of all backgrounds, but just to give you a sense of, we don't even have the numbers of Muslims in the guild, so, and those are the writers who work in the writer's room. So if we have less than 2%, I don't know how you can distribute that evenly in all these shows and productions that are using Muslim content, it's just impossible. So the, the reality is, and you're talking about gatekeepers, is that we have a lot of creatives. Everybody in this room is a creative, you're all an am amazing people from what I've heard. Um, and it's about getting to a certain level where you can be in a writer's room. It took me personally probably like seven years before I even transitioned into that space. And it took another Muslim person, Rami Youssef, to give me my first opportunity. So I wasn't getting those opportunities from, I'm sorry, but like white people. And until that show came around, we weren't seeing a whole ton of Muslim content. I mean, Zarka, what you did so many years ago and until this day, like that is profound and revolutionary and I commend you for the work that you've done. So. And I just think Canada's like years ahead in terms of, I just think there's a lot more representation here and diversity and you guys are a lot tighter knit communities from what I can tell and from what I can understand, but I'm sure there's a lot of nuance about the Canadian Muslim community that I don't understand. So to answer your question, th there's just not enough of us and, and that's the problem and we need you, we need more creatives. We, it can't just be like the, the few of us that have made it to a certain level. We need more and we need to keep going and then we need executives. So. I can be a writer and then I can go to these production studios and companies and networks and pitch the hell out of a show. It just takes one person to believe in your show, one person to be like, yes, I'm gonna put millions of dollars behind you because it does take millions of dollars, right? It, it is a lot of risk and, and we don't have enough of those people. So at every stage, we're like hitting so many major roadblocks and I'm sure the commissioner can talk about funding because to be quite honest we just need people to believe and trust in our vision and our stories and going back to the first thing we said why is representation so important because it's just storytelling it's 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 the fundamental uh like the first early stages of what we learn as children is stories and those things influence us and impact us so if we don't have muslims just baseline on tv in pop culture and i think 
Pop culture gets a bad rep, but pop culture is, a, is such an important word because that's how we all relate to each other. That's water cooler conversation. We've all, I mean, if you're a filmmaker, we've all seen the latest episode of Succession, right? That's the show we come back Sunday night. Is that what people are watching here? I don't know. But Succession is like the number one show on HBO. So everybody, Sunday night. We're watching Transplant here. Oh, right, what. right, 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 right. So what, what day is your show on the air? <laughs> Wednesday I night. I have to cut that from the video. I just, Anyways, Monday, Monday night, Monday night, Monday night, Monday y'all. Mondays at 10 on CTV, <laughs> get into it. And then six months later on NBC in the US. But, but that's what I mean. We all come around to talk about the latest pop culture. And if, if we can't value that, then I don't think we're going to get far in terms of media. Um, no, very, very good point. Very well said. Claude, the NFB made a conscious decision under your leadership to work exactly on what Sahar is saying in terms of putting more of a budget towards underrepresented communities and more specifically uh, a commitment towards 50% of the production budget going towards women-led projects, which is incredible. My question would be, have, how much thought has been given towards the cross-sectionality of minority women-led projects? Is that something that you guys are further looking into as it relates to the NFB? Well, yeah, um, very interesting. Six years ago, when we made the commitment of having 50% of our budgets on films or projects directed by women, at the time, it was something that was a real, real target. Now, most of the institutions in Canada have taken that kind of commitment and are starting to achieve those figures. But when we did that six years ago, intersectionality was not even in the radar. We're not thinking about that. The only thing we're thinking was that, it could, that mix between men and women. Over the years, over those six years, things have evolved immensely. And now we are more than talking about it. We are aiming to make it. Uh, our biggest problem is uh, data collection. And it's very new that Telefilm, Canada Media Fund, and ourselves, starting in April, we will be starting asking our creators to auto-identify. So basically, the, the answer is that we don't know. We just go by the PIF, we, uh, and we need data. Data is, is key. If you know what you're talking about, you can at least um, make a commitment to reach those, um, those, that, uh, those goals. And our goal at the NFB is to have a talent pool that is representative of the fabric of the country, where we are still an organization run mostly by white people. And the commitment that we made last year, a year ago, was to change that management. Over the last year, we hired five executives Four of them were coming from underrepresented groups. So CBC took the same commitment, Telefilm also. So with those measurable goals and commitments, I think we can start shifting those inequalities that have been there since the, um, the creation of the country. And that has created those injustices that we can read on all your billboards. Right on. Okay, so everybody has now figured out how to use the mic. So we will be opening this up a little bit more, okay? So more of a conversation, less pointed questions towards each of you guys. Having said that, I think the follow-up question, Claude, maybe you'd be best suited to answer, but I do want to make it open to everybody. What response, I mean, we, we, we're talking a lot about this idea of representation. I think we all kind of understand at this point that it's important. Right, I think, you know, like we talked about 15 years ago, we recognized that it was important. What responsibility, and, and this is something that I want to touch on, what responsibility do you think is on the actual gatekeepers themselves, whether that's production heads or, you know, um, organizations like the NFB, you know, do they have a responsibility to pave that path for these creatives or are they looking at it from a strictly business standpoint and it is what it is? What, what are you guys' thoughts on that? 
Well, the, the public institutions in Canada have been, gate, gate, have been gatekeeper because the way the, the market has been created. The NFV was founded in 1939. That was the only place to, to produce films in Canada. Over the years, it has evolved. But when you think about the CBC, the, the major television networks, Telefilm, all of that comes from a very brick and mortar um, construction of gatekeepers, basically run by white Anglophones. At some point, it evolved white Francophones. <laughs> and uh, slowly, slowly things are changing, but inevitably, you're, you're, you're managing with all the unconscious bias you've been raised with. And the only way we can change that is to, those institutions will remain. Of course, there will be always uh, creators that will be able to emerge to the, the, the new networks, but at least for the couple of years coming, those institutions will be the game, uh, the very important instruments of, uh, of creation in the country. And if we don't change the, the the, um, the way we are open to the diversity of what the country is, to our management, our producers, our decision makers, that's the only way we'll be able to change things. So, so my answer to that is that at the, at the upper level of the organization, it has to be very diverse, to have different point of views. And uh, just to finish, as uh, we used to have as a producer, a uh, director directing stories about something that they were not belonging to, say, uh, um, uh, a white filmmaker doing a story about indigenous stories. That, will, that, that is not happening anymore, and that should be the same thing for the creators, to tell their story, to be within an environment when they can talk about it with, um, with um, people of the same same approach and same um, um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, authenticity. sorry authenticity. authenticity yeah I disagree like <laughs> it just just in that I, I completely agree with the notion that like a, a white director should not be telling an indigenous story but how come for generations and for decades white people have gotten to tell these stories but People of color and minorities only get to tell stories and only get to build experiences on the limited amounts of stories that get funded to be told. How come there's not like Muslim directors directing an episode of Hudson and Rex or, or those sorts of things? Like we don't get the same kind of exposure or opportunity for stories that go beyond our unique experiences. That, very good point. And I'm sorry, my, my point of view was uh, we do documentaries and other animation. So I, I, was, I was reacting within that. Uh, and I, I wasn't totally challenging you on no, that. No, 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 I'm no, just curious that, as to why very that good isn't point, very an, good point. an yeah. added point of yes. inclusivity, you know? Yes, yes. Like, yeah, mixed, mixed themes, no. uh, being a, able to work with uh, a complementary environment of uh, different perspectives. Yeah, no, I get it for fiction, drama, absolutely. And another question, why is Quebec so much better at supporting the unique voices of their artists? Because, as, like, I watch a lot of movies, I try to consume Canadian content, but it seems to me that Quebec is Films that come out of Quebec specifically are the only ones that are doing massively on international scale. Directors coming out of Quebec, I mean, the pe four people who are biggest stars in, in, in Hollywood, I mean, like, who's bigger than Denis Villeneuve right now? Jean-Marc Vallée, rest in peace, uh, Xavier Dolan, these are the, I can't, I can't name, the, like, I've listed three Quebec directors within the last five years, and I can't name any other Canadian directors even close to that level. Why is Quebec so much better at doing it than any other province? Well, they all started their careers at the NFB. <laughs> Plug. <laughs> Including Denis Arcan and uh, um, Philippe Falardeau. But no, seriously, um, um, there, there must be something in the water. I mean, I mean, part of it is because Quebec is protected with its own it language is. and culture. Yeah. Just to give people context about Little Moss, before we give Canada such, you know, high marks. 
I'll give you the background of that show because before Little Mosque, we didn't really have a sitcom industry. The understanding was we couldn't do it. We couldn't compete against the Americans because they had millions and millions of ad dollars and Canadians would watch American television shows and we just, did, we don't, we were one tenth, we're like 30 million versus 300 million people. And then one day, you know, the head of comedy came by to Saskatchewan. I live in Saskatchewan to this day and Woo! they were ex expecting pitches and I pitched the show <clears throat> and they said, yeah, we'll make the pilot fully not expecting that it was going to go anywhere because nothing had ever gone <laughs> up to that point, really. And, but what happened was that the American media got hold of that story, that Canada not only was making a comedy about Muslims, it wasn't going to be a family comedy. It was going to be a comedy in a mosque about Islam. And this was on the heels of the 2005 Danish cartoon controversy. They were convinced Muslims were going to bomb the CBC and torch the cars. So they sent the reporters to Canada and we got story after story after story in the New York, you know, New York Times, Al Jazeera, CNN. I remember just being inundated with media and then suddenly the Canadian media was like, what's going on? <laughs> what, is there a TV show <laughs> happening in Canada? By the time we aired, like every newspaper and media outlet in the world <laughs> was camped outside our doors. And I remember a reporter phoned me that after we aired, and, he, and he's like, do you know what the ratings were? And, and, and he gave me the rating, and I, and I was like, I, I don't know, is that bad? <laughs> and he's like, CBC hasn't had these ratings in 20 years since Anne of Green Gable, right? <laughs> and I don't, like, I'll be honest with you guys, I don't think a show like this wouldn't have made it on air and then kept going had the ratings not been so high consistently because once you have those eyeballs there, you can start selling ad dollars. And our highest ad dollars came from Alberta. <laughs> and we, we were, our demographic that was watching us were highly educated. I think we skewed to women from Alberta, university <laughs> educated. And this was really interesting because at the same time there was a show, a reality show about Muslims in Dearborn uh, a reality show. Do you remember, Sahar? It's it All-American Muslim. Yeah. All-American Muslim. And it got yanked from TLC because one man in Florida created a group called Family Values or something and wrote a petition to TLC and said, you are making Muslims look normal and they're going to make us feel like they're safe and then they're going to kill us. And this is subversive you know, a television the, the show. The funny thing, but sorry to interrupt you, Zarka, the funny thing about that show behind the scenes is that the characters, the real families of all, all American Muslim, they were so nice to each other that the producers were like, there's no drama. Like, why are these, why are we filming these people? They're like so nice. So they had to create the drama with it. Like, that's, it just, it, it's so funny that we are, are also our own worst critics in a way. Like, Muslims, my goodness, we can talk about this. I want you to finish, but I, it's just we funny. Talk about we'll, this out loud we'll, we will, we will. Yeah, There's a but, qu question 11 is, yeah. But I remember the controversy around this show that you're talking about. Yeah, and so what happened with Little Mosque on the Prairie was that we survived because of the ratings, because people were so interested. First of all, they thought we were going to be violent and do something terrible. So our own reputation helped us <laughs> get the media attention that finally we had never been able to do before. So Corner Gas and Little Moss in the Prairie, oddly enough, both out of Saskatchewan, were like these massive national hits, which gave the country the confidence that we could do it. Because before that, we didn't have nationally known shows, not, not to that degree. Not, we didn't have Kim's Convenience or Schitt's Creek or these shows, but it gave the country confidence that we have it because we didn't even have writers or we didn't have that whole industry. Like, I remember the writer's room. It was just stand-up comedians, a bunch of white guys, and me. And there weren't Muslim writers that I could ask. There was no one. And it was crazy. Like, I remember the first Muslim woman I tapped was um, Saadia Durrani, who was a stand-up from Winnipeg. I go, Saadia, please, I can't be the only one <laughs> coming up with... And those were the days where there were 20 episodes a year and that's an incredible order in every show and, and to be the only person that could generate idea after idea but it, after it idea. just goes to show you don't need an entire Muslim 
production team to make a good show. Zarka, you were, you're, as you're saying, you're one person. I, I, I don't feel like we need to have entire production teams. That's great if we do. I would love, I would love that. But just to be clear, I think we can tap into the resources that exist but we need to be the directors, we need to be the writers, we need to be the production heads, and that makes all the difference. So I, I don't think that that's like the ultimate goal. <laughs> the ultimate goal is to have these directors that you all listed make our stories with our partnership and other Muslim directors. But I mean, I, I don't think that that's like the, the penultimate goal. Uh, I think we can do it in, in covalence with other people as well. Hamza, you were going to say something? <laughs> yeah. Um, As a form of progress, no, just to clarify. I, no, I agree. Like, it would be, it'd be dope if there was one brown person in Dune, you know what I mean? Like, it would have been sick if there was a Muslim in Dune. Um, I mean, Zendaya, Javier Bardem, I know. I was just hyperbole, right, guys? I don't but, know, like, should Dune even exist is the question. I, I did watch it twice in theaters, so I don't know. Like, visually, I can't argue. It's a well-made film. What do you want? Um, I don't actually think I have okay. anything relevant to so, say. Okay, so, fair enough, fair enough. I, I, please, Claude, go ahead. No, one thing, though, I think that the, the key creative team, there needs to be um, opportunities to 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 build up the, that capacity and and uh, to um, so we I saw from the stats over the last six years the way we've been able to increase at the NFB the number of women uh, being at cinematography from very low we are almost at 50 percent that's it shows that when our producers are thinking well I should get that talent to make it happen it makes a difference and it creates, with, when you have goals like that and, and a commitment, it can create a difference, building, starting careers that will, that will just uh, uh, be able to, to emerge. I, I will say, and this is, I speak for like um, the American industry, uh, I, I do think we make brown people and people of color jump through 50 million hoops to get stuff on air and to even become PAs and like low level positions. Like we shouldn't have to work twice, three times, 10 times as hard as our white counterparts to get these positions. It should not be this difficult. And there's one thing about diversity programs that I have a problem with is that they make people jump through 50 million hoops. I've been in multiple programs. Uh, I'll call them out right now. Uh, the Warner Brothers television writing program um, they uh, hire you for six months, for example, and you're committed to Warner Brothers. They don't pay you, but everything you write in the program they own forever in perpetuity for all time. And the idea is, sorry, throughout the known universe. Throughout the known universe, exactly. Um, and the idea is that That's you should. Actual literature for yes. those who don't know legal speak um, but the idea is that you should be so grateful and so thankful that we're giving you this opportunity to be here versus just you know we, we we write just as many scripts as anybody else we do all the other things but we have to do these programs in order to be taken seriously and I think that's at least in Hollywood is a big big issue do you think that that's changing at all with with proven commercial successes. I mean, Zarka, you had, like you talked about, a massive success 15 years ago on CBC. You know, Rami's been doing incredibly well with his show. Are, are studios starting to recognize that, hey, maybe there's some money to be made out of these projects and maybe we should be backing it? Well, I mean, when I, it was interesting because after Little Mosque, studios called me all the time. I sold pilots to ABC, NBC, Fox, and CBS every one year, every single year. And every year they would turn it down and then turn it down and turn it down. And so for the fifth, and they own it, and then they would own it. And after selling four of them, and they're all Muslim comedies, I was like think, thinking to myself, there's only so many ways I can keep recreating the same show because I, they're gone. So then I th wrote a book. I go, this is the only way I can own my own IP now because I'm tired of not letting it um, it'll disappear, but I did notice that they never made us up to this point. I don't believe any network has made a Muslim family sitcom. Little Mosque on the Prairie sold to Hulu for five years, and then after that, they bought Rami. 
Yes, and everybody's been trying to remake Little Mosque in America. <laughs> I'll say every network is like, can, can, like calling all the Muslim writers, and I don't, I don't know why it's, it's so hard to recreate that magic that you had for the show, and I, I don't know, do, do you know about this? Do you know that Americans I know are... that it's interesting because I'll find out about it. It's, this, it's a very complicated um, story for me because I, because it was my first show, I didn't own it. So it's a white company that And why it. is that? Why are you in those rooms and in those positions? And it's, it's, like, it's hard for me to talk about it because there's a lot of things I would have to bring out, which is not, <laughs> this is not the, the place. But I would say what Little Moss did do was it opened up an executive's eyes to the fact that you could have diverse shows and that white audiences would watch. So suddenly after Little Mosque, Jane the Virgin, Superstore, Modern Family, we saw a lot of diversity open for other communities that had hadn't opened in the same way before. So that much happened. But there is a disconnect with the Muslim community. And part of it probably has to do a lot with the relationship that America has with its policies, military, industrial complex, because that industry is primarily, you know, associated with attacking Muslim countries. I mean, the war on Syria, the war on Iraq, there's a big push not to see us as human beings. And I think there's part of that reason is, is exists for that reason. I remember I was on a panel with Muslims and they just called it out. Like, we can't be seen as fully human. It's an issue. I think if you read a book by Jack Shaheen called Real Arabs, R-E-E-L, I think he had an incredible statistic, like a thousand films over, I don't know how many years, and maybe, I think less than 10 had positive Muslim depictions. It, there's a reason for that. There is a reason that Muslims, if you dehumanize Muslims, you can get away with a lot more internationally with American foreign policy and, and destabilizing Muslim countries. Yeah, I, I will say, I do think things are changing like incrementally, very slowly, unfortunately. I mean, Rami, the show obviously opened a lot of doors. There's a, I think Lady Parts is amazing. I wish we had Lady Parts in America. I, yeah, we're trying. I think it's much, much harder for Muslim women to be depicted as human, as nuanced humans as sexual humans so i my goal my personal goal in life is to is to inshallah have like a show about muslim women but but it is getting a little bit better but the problem is that we're we're now developing shows for the white gaze like i truly do feel like a lot of these shows that get greenlit or in pilots or in development you still the, the executives who are running it are all white people they're not muslim i mean you get lucky to get like a person of color who's like a little woke and they'll be like trying to help you you know like i had to, when i was pitching this hbo show that you referenced um we had to find all the like brown people in the network so we're like who's at netflix like who's brown and there's like one iranian we're like let's pitch to that person let's pitch to the hbo lady she's actually white lover uh her name is allegra she's awesome but it's again it takes like that what we had to go and research and be like who's like politically aligned with us who's gonna like help us who's gonna be our champion within the network and then you have to like your blood sweat and tears have to go into this pilot which has been in development for six months and i know that a lot of pilots go through a lot of crazy development but i think pilots about people of color and diverse stories, whatever you want to call it, like they get scrutinized so much. Why is it that like white men can make 50 million shows about white men? They're not interesting. So let's, I think, I think networks are scared. And so this is, these are the hoops. <laughs> I'm sorry, film commissioner. Um, these are the hoops we have to jump through. And I think to be quite honest, right now, I'm just going to say it. I think Muslim men have a little bit of an easier time. Yes. 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 <laughs> and it's up to you and all the other successful Muslim men to uplift the Muslim women and for us to do it ourselves, and we are doing it. And, um, and I, I love all those people. Again, Rami gave me my first opportunity, but I think we have so much more work to do. We've, we've touched a lot on the production side, the studio side, the director side. 
I want to talk a little bit about the creative actors side of the equation. We've, we've had a chance through our podcast and through the Oscars more generally to speak to a lot of up-and-coming actors. There's a lot in the room today. How much of a responsibility do you guys think actors, as Muslim actors, have in not taking trope-type roles? I mean, we've spoken to a lot of people who say, listen, like, I'm getting started in my career. I got to take whatever comes at me, whether that's being a terrorist or being a cab driver with an accent. You know, I'm trying to get my career started. You know, that's not something that I can make a, take a stance on. How much of a responsibility do you think falls on Muslim creatives? And it's open to everybody, but Hamza, I'd like your perspective, sorry. Well, I did it. You know what I mean? First four years, it was just that. And then I was lucky enough, and I know a lot of like brown actors, they don't have that relationship with their agents or are happy enough doing it because they're making money and getting on American shows and stuff like that. But I just told them, I'm just like, I don't want to do terrorist stuff for like three years. You know what I mean? Let's just not do it for the next three years. And I haven't had to do it since, you know? And they were just okay with it. They were like, you're going to lose on a lot of money. And I did. And it was just somebody else did it. And that's the thing. The problem is... Uh, me taking myself out of that equation isn't going to stop people from writing it. It's just going to mean that I don't get the paycheck. They give it to somebody else who fits the mold. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a Muslim, doesn't have to be a brown guy, just somebody who looks not white, ambiguous enough to be just like, yeah, you're kind of Latino. Yeah, you can be a terrorist. It's fine. You know what I mean? But ultimately, I think the responsibility, as far as acting is concerned, is that actors are what give acting a bad name you know everybody thinks acting is a particular thing and they want to you know get rich famous and everything like that and a lot there's people in this room who've had that conversation with me and there's a lot of young brown actors be like bro like how do i get into a movie and stuff like that bro like i'm working out all the time should i go to vancouver what am i doing to, like i got my ig followers up and i'm just like you are not you haven't said one thing about acting you know like you haven't you like I think acting, and I, can, I feel like I can speak enough about creatives in general, is that if you want to be respected as an artist, you have to respect your art form first. Like, like, I'm beyond, like, I face racism in the workplace. I, I, got, I got racist stuff spewed at me after winning the CSA, days after winning it and stuff like that. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm done with like trying to convince these that I'm a valuable person. I'm a valuable artist and I make you money. You speak one language, it's money. I'm doing it for you, so talk to me nice. That's it. Like, I'm not gonna, like, like genuinely, it's, it's great being brown, it's great being Muslim, but that can't be the thing that you stand on if you're trying to convince somebody you're a good filmmaker. Prove to them that you're not only a good filmmaker, but that you can do this better than they can. You can tell our stories better than they can, and you have to wait. Unfortunately, there's all these hoops you have to jump through that she's mentioned, and you're just gonna have to wait it out. Might take one year, two years, three years, four years of extra work before I got a speaking part. That was it. But you gotta wait, and you, you, can't, you can't copy hard work like it shows on camera. And if you show up as an irrefutable talent, they can't ignore you. you. Like, so that's my advice. I hope that answers your question. I, I, I don't even know if anybody wants to follow that up. Anybody? No? Okay. Um, no, thank you. And now Maz is going to dance for us for the next <laughs> three minutes. Yeah. Maz is going to do his 12-minute solo. It's going to be great. Um, no, that's, I mean, that's incredible advice, and I think that's something that everybody can learn from regardless of what stage in their career they're at, right? I mean, it's not just relevant to those starting out. It's relevant to anybody at any, at any point. I guess as a follow-up, the only question really I would have is that do you feel that that conscious decision that you made to no longer take those parts, did that limit you in being able to continue to be a part of that the process? Like, did, were you, did you stop getting calls, or did it refocus you and say, no, I'm just going to focus on my craft, and when the call comes, it comes, and I don't give a shit. It affected a lot of things in that I stopped working on set, 
and I had to ask my parents for money way more. And I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, like in the sense that I know a lot of people are still struggling with that conversation about like, how do I convince my parents to, I guarantee you the anxiety around having the conversation is way more difficult than the conversation itself. I had it, it sucked, but they were behind me. They were just like, all right, cool, it is what it is. Ultimately, I've been, I've been taking acting classes for 11 years. I still take them every Sunday. That's my job. My job is to become a better actor, and I take time off of that to make money on set. Right on. Um, please do. This is going to feel like a personal attack, but it's not. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that first and foremost. But I know what you're going to ask. OK. Should I just answer it first? <laughs> no. We, How do we, you justify playing no, the No, 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 no. Listen. <laughs> Listen, listen. No, but I, I will say that another stereotype that is starting to develop for Muslims, I mean, you know, there's the, like, you said it off the hop, right? We're either the perpetrators of the trauma or the victims of the trauma. And I think, you know, that victim, we call it, you know, trauma porn. The label has kind of come out of the, uh, 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 out of the conversation. You know, that stereotype that we're starting to see of, the, of Muslims just being portrayed as the victims of trauma is something that is starting to, you know, start to, to come out more and more. How important is it, and this is a question for everybody, how important is it to make sure that we have stories of joy, you know, comedies, as you were talking about, Zarka, um, or if we are going to dive into those topics of, of trauma and hardship, that we do it with nuance and that there's layers to that individual and that's not just their defining characteristic. Which I think Transplant does a great job of, by the way, just as a, con as a Thanks. qualifier. <laughs> yeah. um, please. So a, a couple of years ago, I read all these... Um, you remember, do you remember the movie The Big Sick? Yeah. So I was reading angry, angry, angry think pieces about all these brown women going, why is it when there's a man, a, a man of color and it's a romantic comedy, the brown women are the, the romantic foils but they're like, something's wrong with them until, you know, he'll date them until he finds the white trophy. And then she's the one, the princess. And that, and that made me laugh. And I thought, oh, one day I'm going to do a show where that's going to happen to a woman. But instead of getting like angry, she's going to get revenge and she's going to compete with her white trophy. <laughs> and, and I had an opportunity. There's a program, saw her in Canada because we're government funded. And so we have a different system. And I had an opportunity to make a trailer. And I decided to make a trailer about um, a, a, a middle-aged Muslim woman who finds out online that her ex-husband is getting remarried to a white yoga instructor half his age. And she gets angry and immediately tells everybody, I'll be coming to your wedding with my white boyfriend, Brian, the brain surgeon. And she's going to go after his white trophy with her white trophy, and it's going to be white trophy against white trophy. And I wanted to do a story about a vindictive, bitter Muslim woman who's divorced and do a show about that because it's got nothing to do with any of the stuff I've ever done before because that's a universal theme. Muslim women get divorced and they get jealous and bitter and angry and they have revenge fantasies. And so we did this pilot and it just got like over like 100,000 views, and which, which qualified us in, in the Canadian system to get more money. And then we got a CBC license to make a short form web series. And, that, and then I, what I did was, because it was small enough, I could own it. And here's the key. This is the first time I own my own television series, right? So Little Mosslin Prairie was owned by another company that got the license, and they own it, and they can sell it, they can do whatever they want. They, they, they don't need me. But when you own something, then that means you make all the hiring decisions. Who you pick as the writers, who you pick as the directors, who you pick as the crew, every single decision. And that's when I realized that's where the power is, is if you own a production company and you have enough of a background, because now, now I have a show behind me, so CBC takes me seriously. So I said, I want a Muslim female director for the first one, an indigenous woman director for the second one and a white woman for the third one. I want it to be all female. I want a full female crew. 
And so I made those decisions because I had the power to make those decisions. I wanted to hire punch-up writers, all female, indigenous, Muslim. Like, I could see that's where the power was. And I dealt directly with the CBC, who are the gatekeepers. They direct, dealt directly with me. I made the decisions. I was the showrunner. The showrunner is the top job in a television series who makes all the decisions. So on Little Mosque, I was not the showrunner. So a white man, and they, they only ever gave it to a white man, and they wouldn't train me up. And it didn't occur to me why. I was just trying to survive on that show because it was so political. Because it had been so popular, there was this incredible power politics that was going on. Like every year I would come to Little Mosque and the executives of CBC would either be fired or the entire room had disappeared and the showrunner was gone. We had a different showrunner every year. It was so chaotic because there was so much power and chaos going on. But my husband gave me the best advice. He goes, stay in that room and learn to write. Because the biggest skill I learned was the craft, perfecting the craft of writing. Because as a showrunner, you have to solve the story problem. It comes down to you. When there's a problem, when, when there's a, a, especially comedy, it's a very difficult form of writing. It's drama, but another level. And uh, there's no way I could have been a showrunner for my next show had I not gone through six years, 20 episodes each, training day in and day out and learning from the best in the country to become the showrunner of the next show. Because that person, makes the hiring decisions. In fact, that person makes every single decision now for the next show. And that was my goal. And now my goal, if this show can go to half an hour, is to hire Muslims who I will now train to become showrunners for their shows. Because you just can't become a showrunner. Just like, oh, you can't wake up one day and say, I'm gonna have my own television series. No, you have to be a junior writer in a room, an apprentice for years until you build up the skills to run your own room. And that's what we're missing, is a training model. It's like plumbing. And so writers have to be hired in great numbers across the board and work their way up, and then they pitch their stories and get past the gatekeepers. But the gatekeepers themselves have to change because that's where it stops, right? They can stop it, and that's the end of the line. The gatekeepers at CBC have changed. I pitched the half an hour to two women who are not white for the first time in my entire career since I began. And it was an entirely different experience. The women were listening to me pitch my stories and they were saying things like, that happened to me, I can relate to that, I understand what you're saying. And it was the first time I felt heard. I was telling one of my friends, I go, this is a really weird experience pitching to two women who belong to the BIPOC community. It was a totally different world for me. And so that's what has to change. The gatekeepers who decide which shows get greenlit, they have to change. And then the people that are pitching to them have to be people who have come up through the system and have gained the skills of writing and solving story problems so then they can go on to show on their own shows. And that's how the system works. So if I can get this next show to half an hour, that's my goal, is to staff it with Muslims, give them the skills, work them up through so that they can go on and show run their own shows. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Sahar, you've, you've made a conscious decision, I think, anyway, and maybe there's more of a question, but have you made a conscious decision um, to focus your screen adaptations and your original work on more of these stories of everyday human experiences, but through the lens of Muslims, rather than tackling sort of these more traditional storylines of, you know, trauma or terror or things like that. Is that, has that been a conscious decision for you or is it? Yeah. Um, such a good question. Uh, y yes and no. Uh, I got really lucky to, I think, work on, my first show was Rami. Before that, I was at YouTube Originals, which is <laughs> the Netflix of YouTube. I was one of those like junior execs, I was trying to get to that level. I was trying to become an executive. Um, and I was like an assistant first. I was an assistant for like three years. And then I was a coordinator. And then I was a junior exec. And a lot of Muslim people reach out to me and they're like, how do I do this? And it's like, you, you have to start at the bottom, unfortunately. Like if you see these 
really um, accomplished people and you're like, oh my God, they just made it. It's like, no, most people have been working at their craft for many, many, many years. But I, I wanna answer your question. So that's one thing, but the reason I left that executive world when the network world is because I literally asked all the agents, I was like, can you send me a, a writer who's a Muslim woman? <laughs> And they couldn't find anybody. Like all the, or the, they could, and all the stories were like trauma porn or refugee crisis or whatever, which are important stories. I don't want to like um, put those stories down at by any means. But at the time, insecure, um, like fresh off the boat, like these stories were re really gaining traction, and it was just about like everyday normal people who just happened to be Asian or who just happened to be black. And I was like, where's the, where's that? And then. When, when I was like, okay, I, I can't find it, I'm just, just F it, like, I'm gonna go do it myself. And I think a lot of Muslims and brown people were conditioned to believe, like, we can't do the thing that, like, all the white people are doing. And unfortunately, that's because of where we come from, it's our parents, it's, it's generational trauma, it's like our parents came here to give us a better life, and we cannot risk like becoming artists because, God forbid, we won't have more money than our parents, and that's just like, a trauma that we have to actively work against. Like we have to be the change we wanna see and we just have to, we just can't operate out of fear anymore. And I think that's what's generationally happening with us. And I'm hopeful that like all of us will continue to pave that path forward. So I left the network to become a writer and I got really lucky to work on Rami, again, a show that wasn't about anything other than this guy just like living his life. And that's where I was like, we can do this. We can tell stories that are nuanced and different and they don't have to be about war or immigrants or anything like that. And so, yes, the active choice to not take on um, what we call like IP, like a lot of agents will be like, this book is so popular, let's adapt it, or this article. IP is, is so popular right now because it's something that they can like, you know, financially justify, like if a book is becoming popular or an article. So everybody wants to like recreate podcasts and books. So I get sent a lot of this stuff. I, I, I got sent like, I get sent all the Iranian stuff. Like basically every single like prisoner story, every like terrorist story, I get sent all that. And there's potentially a lot of money in that, but you have to say no. And I think, I know it's harder for actors, but I think if we all actively said no, nobody would be able to do it. So it does take numbers. Like it takes all of us to be like, we're not gonna take this role, we're not gonna write this show. And a lot of shows have died because of that reason, because nobody would write them. Like a lot of the Muslim writers would be like, I'm not doing this. And so the project just dies in development, which is great. <laughs> no, great point. And that, unless, go ahead. unless they get a white person to do it and then somehow, justify it with like all the brown token cast. So for example, um, I don't know if you guys know of a show called Tehran on Apple TV. It's like the worst form of Israeli propaganda. And I'm just gonna go there. It's terrible. It's, Israel, it's like an all Israeli writer's room. And I've spoken to the, the producers on a panel because they were there. And I was like, how do you justify an all Israeli writer's room writing about a show that's entirely based in Iran. And it was mind blowing that like Apple TV, all these producers, all these production companies, I mean, I guess it's not so mind blowing when you know the politics of it, but that they got away with zero Iranians in the writer's room, that this show even exists. It's like, it's insane. It's like about a Mossad agent who like infiltrates Iran and like the first scene is like a beheading in a square and it's like, what? Like if you've ever been to Iran, it's like absolutely insane. But the way they get away with it is all the actors are Iranian and they all signed up to be on this god awful show um, because Iranian politics are nuanced and, and so it's unfortunate, like it's really unfortunate that they all said yes. And so I think we just actively, as in the numbers, we have to be together and united and that's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. In, there's a show called Parker Anderson. Have you guys heard of this family show? It was a, it's a um, mixed race show created, I think, by a, a white man. When it ca came to hiring directors, no black director would sign on to this show. 
And the network finally had to get rid of the white showrunner and hire Anthony Farrell. I don't think, have you guys heard of Anthony Farrell? He's a, he became the showrunner. Because the black community stood up and said, we won't direct this show. It has, it's not written for, you know, with uh, the proper, uh, you know, it has black people and this isn't what we do. It's, the whole writing is wrong. So they had to scrap, they threw, had to throw away all the scripts, hire a black room, a black showrunner, and then it got made. Because the black community stood up, the director, the, they couldn't get any black directors to come on. And so now, you know, Anthony is helping um, train showrunners in the BIPOC community in Canada. We have something called the BIPOC TV and film community, and they hold boot camps for the community. And like, I'm gonna be in one for showrunning that's tomorrow. Awesome. So that's what we have to do as a community. Yeah, I agree. The last question that I have before we get to the audience here is going back to something we touched on a little bit earlier, which is that weight of responsibility that a lot of creatives within the Muslim community tend to have as it relates to their creative works, right? And, you know, we talked about how the Muslim community can be very, very supportive, but also we've spoken to a lot of creatives who have said that you feel this immense pressure almost sometimes in making a show where you're not just making it for yourself, but you're going to be inevitably judged by an entire religion, an entire, entire you know, people, right? And so how has that impacted your guys' decision-making, your work? Um, has that been an added pressure, or has that been a catalyst for you to say, yeah, I, I have that responsibility, and I, take, I don't take it lightly, and I'm going to make sure I'm the best version of myself because of that? Well, it's both. It, like, it has to be both. And 10 out of 10 times, it be your own. You know what I mean? Like, you make one mistake, and it's your community that the first one be like, yo, this guy he doesn't like represent us we disown him immediately because he's showing a part of himself that we don't like within ourselves so we're gonna pretend it doesn't exist so this guy sucks and we're fine and he doesn't belong to us and it's always that response first and it's absolutely heartbreaking we're just like yo man we all went to the same struggles like we all made a lot of the same mistakes growing up I'm okay talking about it like what like you know what I mean but there is that pressure because Ultimately, like, I'm, I'm very proud to be Muslim. I'm very proud to be Pakistani. And for some reason, the, the, yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> and unfortunately, the feeling's not always mu mutual. The Muslim community is not always proud of me. Pakistani community is not always proud of me. And that's just something that you're going to have to deal with. That's just what it is. It's the same thing with family. You're happy to be part of your family, but sometimes your family just doesn't f with you that way. Excuse my language, but like, they just don't. But it's just, what am I gonna do? Stop loving my family? No, I'll show up, I'll come to the birthday parties, I'm not gonna sit with the uncles as much, but, you know, that's just what it is. It's something that's in me, it's never gonna change. No matter how much I try to reject it, or it tries to reject me, I am connected to it for the rest of my life and for better or for worse, every step that I take is inherently connected to that part of myself and I just have to deal with it. So you do what I'm trying to do, which is just my best, and then you take it as you go. Yeah, I, I agree with that and I would say that this is a big thing I talk about all the time. There's a difference between positive representation and responsible representation. And I think oftentimes we really, really confuse those things, especially in the Muslim community. Unfortunately, because we haven't had representation for a very long time and we've had such negative portrayals of Muslims, we're craving like the perfect Muslim, like they must pray five times a day and fast all around. Like that's just not real. <laughs> like that's just not human emotion. And I think we're so critical of just watching the faults, like you're saying, watching actual human characters on screen. So I always like implore people to just think about like your favorite characters, like Walter White on Breaking Bad. He does terrible things, but people love him because he's nuanced and he has motivations that are internal and emotional. And I think because we we're writing about identity, it gets confused with character emotion. And this is like stupid writer talk, I guess. But if you're a real filmmaker, if you're a real writer, you're always gonna go back to human emotion. And if you don't have that, then you're not a good writer. 
And so I, it's, it's, we need to separate positive representation and that word really, really, it makes me cringe to be honest, um, versus responsible representation. And those are two very different things that we, we can talk about. But th I would say that all of our favorite characters have flaws and, and we have to reckon that with like what we're watching on screen. Uh, and, and that just takes time and it takes practice and it takes us doing it over and over and over again and having multiple forms of representation, not just one. Hamza can't be the only brown dude on TV. Like We need more and he's not. And, and we need more women and we need more like m different races. Like I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm tired of seeing Arab or South Asian Muslims. Like we're, those are not the only monoliths. Like we, we, there's so much more diversity within the Muslim community. Um, and that's something we have to educate directors, we have to educate producers, we have to educate casting directors, we have to tell them it's okay if the Muslim person is not Arab or South Asian, they can be literally anything. Um, so the, it's important also to not tokenize ourselves. That's another thing. I will admit fully, I've been tokenized in probably every writer's room I've been in. Uh, I didn't know it sometimes. Uh, it came to me afterwards and I was like, oh, I realize what was happening here. Sometimes it's subconscious, sometimes it's conscious, and you just have to be self-aware. You just have to be like, why am I here? Why am I on this set? Why did they hire me? I'm not saying be paranoid about every single job you get, but you have to realize like, there are moments in time where you think something is positive, but it's just a form of tokenization. So just, we, we have to be really critical about our own art, about white people's art, about every single type of art form, not just Muslim art forms. Maybe, maybe say your name, what, okay. you, what, what you do in terms of, if All you're right. an artist. So my my yeah. name is Zahra Dean. I work with Guava Productions. We're a production company here in Edmonton. And so one of my questions... <laughs> <laughs> what are your socials? Let people know so they can follow you. At Guava Productions Canada. Let's get it, people. Let's go. Pull out your phones. Follow our brother. Oh, All right. Yeah. yeah, so uh, there's this book. It's called The Third Door. And we've been like on this conversation of uh, gateways and everything. Um, one of my questions here is how can we get creators, especially, to connect with people that are in like the Web 3.0, NFT space. How can we get creators to uh, get in on these trends? Because these are the, this is the next form of art. This is our next art form. And one of my challenges to Moskers especially here uh, is can we get creators and programmers and IT, IT experts together? Can we get creators to jump on this NFT trend where Tory Lanez uh, is, goes platinum within a minute? Is that possible? Can we establish uh, these kind of, I want to say like, um, uh, uh, connect, connecting events? Because this is where it's at for us. This is where it's at for all of us young people that are getting in on Oculuses and VR and all this fun stuff. This is where it's at for us. Thank you. Thank you. No, oh, that's awesome. I mean, I, I can just quickly start from the Moscow's perspective. I mean, I think, you know, South by Southwest is probably the leading example in that cross collaboration of tech and film and media and all sorts of different things. And, you know, the Moscow's 15 years ago was 300 people on substage at the University of Alberta, um, all pretty much within the Muslim community. And now it's, you know, inshallah tomorrow we'll, we'll have between 1,500 and 2,000 people in a massive auditorium and three different functions and 250 creators in this room. So. Hopefully in 15 years or, or way sooner than that will be, will be everything you're saying and more. But I think you, you raise a really interesting question, which is, you know, about the evolution of creative mediums, right? And, you know, is that something that you guys have thought about as creatives? Is that something the NFB has thought about as a funding source? Well, we, we, uh, we have a, a very important part of what we do in, in interactive work and uh, digital storytelling. It's, uh, it's uh, basically creating those space where people, producers and creators can meet and get those, uh, those uh, network opportunities. Because we know there are barriers in, in all the networking um, 
uh, it's uh, the, all, all the discrimination is at every level. Networking has its own uh, discrimination. So how can we open it? I think it's uh, it's organization like yours working with uh, with institution like ours, like uh, those gatekeepers to create those. Uh, those forum of exchange and uh, opportunities. Yeah, yeah. It, from a, from like a cru uh, evolution of creative mediums, is that something that you guys have personally looked at at all or no? I barely understand what crypto is, so like, like just genuinely. But I mean, it seems like, like if you if you, if you're making a you know a parallel to someone like Tory Lanez who's able to do this really quickly, it seems like it's kind of the same thing as like how in this space do we get our own creatives to be as mainstream as somebody else and I feel like it would have to be a similar formula in a question of more exposure more representation and more products and you know projects available to people like us and widespread uh, um, acceptance from our own communities which will spread into like other communities as well but I have no idea what an NFT is like still don't don't know any of that stuff so right on okay does that make sense it does to me i don't know all right cool Thanks. um Guava any other canada yeah please go ahead if you have a mic please go ahead okay. uh first things first salam alaikum and uh bonjour commissioner nice to see you uh first i have two questions uh, oh, your your name and, and what you do my name is ibrahim sabzwari i'm a ufc student i'm transitioning to becoming a filmmaker inshallah i'm gonna be I uh, flew in from Toronto with my friends who came in this morning, so we're, we're very happy to be here. Um, first question is for Zarka, hopefully. Uh, I've tried comedy writing. I wanted to do stand-up at some point, and it's really hard. So I wanted to ask you, how do you write comedy six seasons in a row and not get burnt out? That's the first thing. Second thing, I really like how we're talking about responsible filmmaking. I feel like we're responsible as creatives, as Canadians and Muslims. So my question is, are we responsible to stay in Canada as creatives, or are we forced to go to LA and American stuff like that to be creatives? Thank you. Well, I live in Saskatchewan, <laughs> so how do you not get burnt out? It was hard. Twenty seasons. I don't recommend that for any show. That's a lot of episodes. Sorry, not twenty seasons. Twenty episodes per season. That's that's the that's the high end of it. And it was and it was it was so hard. I can't, and we had, and we in Canada, we can only afford tiny, tiny writers' rooms, like six to maybe seven. Can, and how big are they in LA? For comedy, like 10, 12? 12. And so, Sometimes. and then having to come up with idea after idea after idea. It was like, it was literally like writing seven feature films in six months, right? And I remember after every season would be over, like for six months, I would like just not. I'd be, be like, let's just go in the basement and sleep for, for, my kids were like, let's go on vacation. I'm like, no, let's go in the basement and turn off the lights and just lie down right? for six months. It was emotionally and physically and mentally exhausting. And I was really glad when that show ended because there, we only ever had one other Muslim and it was so much responsibility and so much pressure and the Muslim community themselves were reacting very badly to the show when it first came out. They were like, this is exactly what you were saying. Why aren't all the Muslims perfect and good? And why is Babur always bad? And, and so, you know, they had turned on me for the first two years. I had to resign. From, my husband was the president of the mosque. He, and they were trying to convince him to divorce me. <laughs> it was a terror. Thank God Facebook hadn't been invented and social media wasn't a thing. But it was really hard in the first few years to get the Muslim community to come around and say, you know, this isn't even an edgy show like Rami. <laughs> like, and, now, and now we're seeing more and more shows coming out. And, and I see the comments um, on the comment section going, this isn't as respectful as Little Mosque on the Prairie. And I'm like, yeah, well, in my day, you were having such fits. And the Muslim community has to grow and become more sophisticated in how they see us on television. We cannot all be these perfect characters because that's propaganda and no one will watch that. And we have to show us as nu nuanced, fully represented people. And sorry, what was your second half of the... Uh, second half of the question was, as Canadians, do we have a responsibility to be creative in Canada? Or are we forced to go to LA and the States to, to enter these creative spaces? I think you should do to wherever you are. You can do, if I can do it from Saskatchewan, you can do it from wherever you are. You yeah. go with the opportunities 
lead you. It just happened that living for me, living in Saskatchewan worked out because the CBC was looking for regionality and representation and I happened to be in the one part of the country that they never represent. So it worked out. Um, in terms of my career, if, if television for me wasn't working out or t film wasn't working out, that I just moved sideways. For me, I can write, a, if you can write comedy, you can write it in many different mediums. So I wrote a memoir that was comedic. I just written a novel. It's a satire about terrorism. And a lot of Muslims are very angry with me because they're like, we don't want to see the word Muslim and terrorism in the same sentence ever again. And I'm like, listen, we have to get over that. You can satirize this and take the power out of it through comedy. We have to stop being afraid of the word terrorism and we have to own it and change it and put our spin on it in the way that the Jewish community has done with Hitler. You know, if you watch the producers, the Jewish community was very angry you know, with Mel Brooks because they felt he made light of Hitler. And he said the biggest way to destroy totalitarianism is to mock them and make fun of them. And for me, when ISIS emerged in 2014 and the whole world like was saying, this is the culture of Islam and Muslims. They just normally become jihadists and try to destroy the world. I was like, no, there's something behind this group and it's American foreign policy and I'm gonna satirize this world and turn it on its head and show how much damage has been done to the Muslim world, but I'm gonna do it through satire and comedy because that is the way you can defeat stereotypes. And, it, and a lot of Muslims are like, why, why did you write this book? I mean, you have the word Muslim and terrorism in the same sentence, and I'm like, you've got it. We, we as a community, as Sahar says, we have to get over this now. We have to become more nuanced and more sophisticated in the types of stories we can tell about ourselves and not be upset all the time if, if we see something negative about ourselves. It's, it's what you were saying. There's a difference between responsible storytelling and positive storytelling. And, you know, the Muslim community has come full circle after watching Little Mosque and realized nothing catastrophic happened to us. It was a show that represented us well. And, but I mean, it was a lot, it was a lot to go through you guys. And you can just talk, to, you know, my son is sitting here. I remember they would, they were little, they were so little. I had to leave them. I'm a mother of four children. And Zane was only six when the show was made. And they was, yeah, no, hold on. it was, a, <laughs> it was, it was, they, it was a political decision to move it out of Saskatchewan to shoot it in Toronto. So I had to leave my kids for six months of the year while my husband worked part-time and started raising them. And I remember him coming home and holding my hand and goes, Mommy, I just came back from the mosque. People don't like you. <laughs> and they were you know, trying to be protective and caring of me. And it was really like psychologically hard to hang in there and going, I'm not doing something bad. Like this, you know, we will see this through. And, it's, and so, so sometimes when you make art, you have to put on these blinkers. You have to put on blinkers and not look sideways, not read social media or obsess over Goodreads and your reviews. Just believe in the work that you're doing. Make sure your intention is to please your creator and just do it. And don't worry what your community says about you. Because if you do that, then you'll dilute what you do and you'll never be able to make a really good product. That is my advice to you, is to have a vision, believe in it, and just do it. Hello, assalamu alaikum. My name is Aisha Lasfar. I am a visual artist based in Calgary. Um, and I am also a mother, so I'm very inspired by your story, mashallah. And thank you to the whole panel for coming out here all the way up in uh, Alberta. We really appreciate it. Um, my question today is for Hamza. Um, Hamza, I sort of know you, which is a little weird. Um, okay. <laughs> not really. How? Um, I'm also from Ottawa. Bruh. And uh, I, remember, I remember seeing you play basketball in the Bayshore Community Center. Yo, that's sick. Yo, you make me cry. That's dope, man. So um, my question is for you because you are really inspiring me because on top of being a mom and a visual artist, I also want to get into acting, inshallah, and it's inshallah. like something that always I've always wanted to do since I can remember, but it's that kind of dream that really gets shot down, you know, especially when you're a kid, it's like when people ask you what you want to do, you're like shy to say that you want to be an actor because it sounds so far-fetched when you're a kid, like something like being a firefighter, an astronaut or something, it's like, oh, how cute, you know, but we all know you're not gonna do that. 
Um, especially I still in, get that. <laughs> especially <laughs> in a community like Ottawa, like you know what it's like there. The Muslim community there is, um, it's not a super artsy city, or it wasn't, at least back in the day. And so I just want to ask you, I guess, what would you tell yourself um, if you went back to the beginning of your acting journey, what would you tell yourself um, to get started, like any sort of um, thoughts or advice? And also, what made you want to become an actor um, coming from the same environment that I did? Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. That was so nice, man. I, I always smile when I hear about Bayshore, man. It's just, just like such an immigrant hood, you know? <laughs> like parents moving there and stuff like that. I'm sure so many of us have that. Um, I, you know, alhamdulillah, like, I wouldn't change anything. Like, I really wouldn't. I'm very fortunate for the journey that I've taken, the fact that it took me, like, four and a half years to even, like, muster up the courage to take that leap, you know? I told my parents I was going to drop out. They said no. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> I was, that, that was it. But I told my dad I wanted to be an actor, and he was just like, what, like, what have you done? Like, what, what's your plan? And I had zero plan. So he was just like, come up with a plan, earn your degree, and as soon as you uh, earn, that, uh, earn that degree, we'll execute the plan. But you got to get the degree first. And we had one conversation about it and never talked about it again. Graduated, moved to LA. That was it. And honestly, some, like, um, a, a lot of you guys know who Imran J. Khan is, but like, um, he said something to me about some advice that he got about whether he should go into filmmaking and everything like that. If there's any way that somebody can convince you not to do it, don't do it. Genuinely. This industry, this artistry, it sucks. It sucks and it's only worth it if you love it and you can't do anything else. Like... Genuinely, you want to make money, go to, you know, you, you, you go to, go, like, and if you can't get into med school, go into med school in the Caribbean, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know what I mean? Get whatever degree from any Canadian university and get a six-figure salary in the Gulf. Like, you can make money doing anything. This is a terrible industry if you're in it for the money. If, and that was, that was my goal. I knew, I, I you know, uh, like we talked about opportunities and everything like that our parents struggles and their generation struggle was survival so when i asked my parents for money i never felt any guilt about it and shout out to all the oldest siblings out there because i'm the youngest sibling so i know what y'all went through so thank you for taking all the hits i couldn't you know thank you for doing all that because you diluted the strictness of my parents so by the time it got to me they were just like yeah whatever just get your degree whatever i don't care um, and, I, and I needed that but like there's this there's this stigma around like asking for help there's a stigma around not making X amount of money and being marriage material by the time you're 26 you know what I mean there's all this like nonsense and like somebody's got to remind these people that for the first five years after med school, you're making less than school teachers, you know what I mean? Somebody's got to remind these people. So if it takes 10 years to make that kind of money, it might take 10 years as an actor as well. So borrow, try, sleep on people's sofas, travel. And man, I, I, don't, I don't even know how you can do that with a kid, but like, I'm sure you can. Like, I'm certain you can. And you know, like if we've got Ottawa Connection, I got your back. So, if you need anything, you know, genuinely, genuinely, you, you want to you wanna shadow, start anywhere. Genuinely, just start. Like, if you just make a commitment to start, as opposed to spend the next four years talking about starting, you'll be further ahead than 95% of the people who talk about starting. So just do it, and then see where it goes. Right on. Um, our last question of the <laughs> evening. I th oh, yeah. oh we've got right on. Go ahead. Um, hi, uh, I have a question for Zarka and Sahar. Uh, my name is Bia. I'm a filmmaker from Edmonton. For Sahar, you mentioned that you write for HBO and 824. It's my dream to work there. I just want you to elaborate on how you got your foot in the door with them. And for Zarka, you mentioned you own a film production company. And I'm wondering if you could give me some insight to how your production house came to be and how I can create my own. Yeah, so to, 
To clarify, and I think a lot of people confuse when you say like you have a show in development at a certain place. So I don't work for A24, I don't work for HBO, um, but I have a project in development with them and I got that through. Um, so, I'm, so I've been writing for a long time, uh, but I, I, I worked on Rami Youssef's show, Rami had an overall deal with A24, after I worked on season one, he was like, what do you want to do next? And I think that's a really great example of, you know, uplifting people around you, your fellow writers, you know, asking people around you, what do you want to do? So that was very kind and, and, you know, I had this idea, I'll tell you guys about the show a little bit, but just... Don't tweet this, I guess. Um, it's being oh, it is? Well, whatever. It's, it was about my personal experiences going to a Muslim high, uh, school. Uh, and I was just like riffing on it. Like I was just like telling him about some stuff that happened there and he was like, that's wild. <laughs> like, has anyone been to a Muslim school? Yeah, Muslim school's wild, but like in a funny way. Like, <laughs> Like in a really funny way, and I was reflecting on all the experiences that happened, and I was like, we've seen Catholic schools on TV, we've seen like Jewish day schools on TV, we've seen every form of like a high school. There's never been a Muslim high school show, and that's crazy, because I love YA, I love teen comedy. So we were just like riffing on it, and we, we, we spent a year developing just the pitch, like not even a script, not like a Bible, just the pitch of like what I would say, um, and then we, we went to all the networks and we pitched the show and this takes a long time. I, I think people really undervalue like development. I think people think like ideas just like pop into our heads and we have the full show just like, you know, you <laughs> like throw it out in a day. It doesn't, it takes a long time and it takes a long time to create a nuanced show. Um, and, and show that has emotional and character development and that every character is like, has their journey and arcs and like the networks wanna see that you've thought about all this. You can't just come in, come in and pitch your identity, which happens a lot. People walk into rooms and they're like, I'm Muslim, make a show about me. And that's just like unacceptable. Uh, your identity doesn't qualify you for anything. It's like, what's the journey? What's your character? What's your conflict? And so when we talk about all these shows, they're also like, emotionally, you know, dramatic shows, and that's interesting. Your show has to be beyond your identity. So we pitched to all the networks, Netflix, Hulu, and America, um, all the streaming services, and we have a lot of opportunities in America. I know it's the, the CBC, and there's very few platforms in Canada, so that is a disadvantage, but Canadians can also pitch in the US, right? Like, that's an opportunity. So you guys have the Canadian platforms, and you also have the US platforms, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, we pitch literally everywhere and you pitch back to back, like you're, you have like weeks and weeks of pitches and you're just like burnt out and drained. But um, yeah, that's the process. You, we developed for like a year and then we took it out and thankfully HBO Max wanted it. Is there any indication of when we can actually see a product on screen? You guys go home tonight. Pray istikhara. I don't know. Pray, make du'as, pray to the to Allah and also the TV gods, and just let's pray. <laughs> we we don't know. Not yet. I'm not That's even go how development that. works. Right You're on. just yeah. like yeah. yeah. We. I mean, it's very similar here in Canada, and but I decided to take it one step further because because of my experience with Little Mosque on the Prairie, I felt okay. The next step for me now is to own the next show. And, but the thing is, to own a show means you have to know the complete nuts and bolts of what it takes to make a television show from, in Canada, we have what we call the federal tax grant, which the, we get money back for um, la labor costs, which is why people come to Canada to shoot shows. You need to understand the, um, the legal side of things, the financial side of things, the hiring side of things, the post-production how to negotiate with agents of actors. Um, we hired Rizwan Manji to be you know, an imam in the show. And I had to deal directly with his agent, you know, like an actor's agent. What, you know, and it's hard. And I, what I, and I thought, okay, if I make a web series, a short form, six episodes, 10 minutes each, it's like a full season, but it's small enough that I can handle the million dollar budget on my own hire the teams, the writer, be the showrunner, be responsible for all the writers. I'm also the post-production supervisor, handle 
you know, I'm right now in the middle of a sound mix, the music is coming in, the sound people want to see it, the color correct, I'm watching, I'm supervising all of that. I wanted to do all the jobs so that I could figure out if this show gets picked up for half an hour, how I would want to hire and structure my company. And I would be aware of what it takes to actually make a show from the top to the bottom. Because I feel that that's the next level for Muslims is to own their own production companies so that they can be the boss and that they can hire all the people and make all the creative decisions. But in order to be at that level, you have to have worked on a television show. So my advice to you is to make, a, to make something small, like a web series, so that you can learn all the roles and then you could make a bigger leap. So that's, that's the trajectory that I'm on and we'll see, I've pitched to CBC just like Sahar pitched to HBO. I did it, I think maybe two or three weeks ago, so we're waiting to hear about a decision. Um, so, but the, tele, but the, the web series that I made will be aired May 13th on CBC Gem. Um, and so you'll see it. And, and that's like a proof of concept, basically. Pardon like me? a proof of concept. Yeah, so I, went, I did exactly the same thing Sahar did, but we went one step above where we actually shot it, um, but a small, like a smaller version of it yeah. as a proof of concept for a half hour. So now it's, and CBC has first right of refusal, meaning that since they granted me the license for, on CBC Gem, they get to decide if they want to make it to half an hour. And until they reject me, I can't take it to the Americans. So I'm there, and so I also asked, like Sahar, if all of you could do a du'a for me as well as Sahar. Uh, and, and I, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just want to say one more thing about writing. Sorry, I feel like I jumped to like I just pitched to HBO. In between writing on Rami, which by the way I was an, a writer's assistant, that's something you can do in a writer's room. Um, it's like an entry level job. You take all the notes all day, every day. It's a very tough job actually. Um, but those there are entry level positions in, in writer's rooms where you can learn the craft of writing. And in America, that's like the way in. Like you've got to be a writer's assistant or showrunner's assistant or script coordinator. Um, and you really have to do the apprenticeship work of learning how to be in a room because that's a whole thing, how to be in a writer's room. It's like a whole craft that you have to learn. And every level, like showrunners the highest, you grow every level. So you have staff writer, story editors, those are all different positions and people know very little about writer's rooms. They're kind of like elusive. And those are the gateways, I think, into getting into those spaces. So literally, it, it's, it's hard. Like everybody's always asking me, how do, you get it? how do you get those jobs? They don't post them anywhere. Showrunners are always hiring their like best friend's daughter for whatever reason. Like it's just, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of nepotism and it, it requires some hustle. But we now being hopefully in those positions, we have to hire within the community and bring people in and and then to understand that like we didn't have necessarily the the education that a lot of people get like film schools and stuff like we have to understand that our community is rising and so it's going to take us time to get people to the level that we need them to be so it's okay if you don't have that experience like let's just get people in let's get them those pa jobs those entry level jobs to then craft them into the showrunner so i worked on four more shows after I pitched my show, uh, 13 Reasons, The Bold Type, Echoes, which is coming out on Netflix in the summer. Um, so you, and, and, I, and those, none of those shows had, well, The Bold Type had a Muslim character shot in Montreal, but none of those other shows had Muslim characters, so it was, it's okay to work on other things that don't have Muslim characters. Like, I can't emphasize that enough as by learning from other people. Um, who might not be Muslim, but they can teach you stuff. And sometimes, honestly, the white showrunners have been very, very helpful to me. And I won't take that for granted. So it takes allies, it takes ourselves, it takes everybody to come together to get to where we want to be. Before we go, you know, we've had this amazing conversation about representation. We've got an um, incredible um, group of people here who represent and here as well, who represent all sorts of different creative mediums, different pieces of the creative puzzle, right? Whether it's gatekeepers, organizations, or creatives themselves. What would be one piece of advice if you had to leave everybody with, and we'll kind of go down the panel if we can, in terms of how we can take that next step, right? How we can start to have more diverse stories, how we can have more authentic representation um, of Muslim 
uh, stories in, in the Muslim community. What would be the responsibility or the piece of advice of a creative or a gatekeeper or an organization that looks to promote those individuals? I think it's very important to, uh, to keep the pressure on organization like ours from, the, from your community to, to ask for resolves, commitments, and, um, and data collection. It's only knowing that, that you can start building that, uh, that uh, change that, uh, that needs to start. Exactly what you were describing, you need to, to, uh, to get the ball rolling. And, and it's, it needs a, a lot of pressure from the milieu and, um, and, and on decision making like me makers like me. Everything that I did over the last uh, six years in terms of gender parity, indigenous uh, commitment, and diversity and inclusion, I did it because I was, I had, I had the, 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 stick, the, the, the people were asking for it. I was open to do it, but I needed that to, to be an agent of change, and it's very important have to, to have uh, do, th that kind of event that you are doing tonight, and, but it needs a constant and ongoing movement of asking, asking for commitments and results. There's so many ways into this industry. If you want to be in a writer's room and you're thinking, what's my way in? Write a half hour original spec script, because people like me will eventually ask agents Send me your Muslim writers and I want to see that script and I will make a decision on hiring. Because I need to still see that you can write comedy. It can't be that you're just a Muslim in a room who wants to be in the room. It has to be someone who has actually done the work, learned the craft, and has put in the time. And you could just study sitcoms, read books, but write a half hour original spec and go out and give it to agents and they will submit you to writer's rooms like myself, because that is the first step you need to take if you're serious about being in a writer's room, is to start writing. So as soon as he said that, I'm just like, I'm gonna try to think of something really smart to say. <laughs> um, we gave you time, so I know. it better be profound. I'm not there. Um, honestly, like, I don't know, like from a technical standpoint, I don't know, man, I'm just, I'm just an actor, I'll, try to, I'll figure out writing in a couple of years, I'll figure out directing a couple of years after that. Honestly, like, take care of yourselves, love yourself, and try to do that authentically, and if you do anything from that place, the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, you guys all said good things. I don't have anything else. No, I, I, I think doing the work is important. I think... Um, like trust in the process. If you are if you write every day or direct or whatever, just take one single step. I think you were saying this, Hamza, like with the acting question, take one baby step. Like it is very overwhelming. A lot of the stuff we said tonight, it's a lot of information. And if you're just starting out, I feel like and can sometimes feel like, wow, like it takes 10 years. Like I, I don't feel like we should scare you guys. I think it's like, that's the journey. That's life. Like it is taking one single step every single day towards your goal so that you can get to where you want to be in like what, however many years it takes. That's how long it takes. Don't look at social media. I feel like social media is such a detriment to our mental health, my own included, because I will literally be like, oh my God, they're making a pilot. Oh my God. Like, I will panic. I have anxiety, okay? We all have anxiety. We need to just tune it out. Like if you're doing the work, if you're putting the effort every single day, um, you're gonna make it. There's actually a quote in Hollywood, I don't know who said it, but somebody said it to me. It's not the most talented people who make it. It's the people who stick it out the longest. So 100%. keep that in mind, don't give up. Um, but if it's truly like literally the only thing you can think about all day, every day, then you should do it. Amazing. On that note, I'd like to thank our amazing panelists. Thank you guys for sticking it out. Such an incredible conversation. Feel very good. Thank you guys. Um,
And a big round of applause for Sikandar for moderating this and uh, organizing this whole thing into Moscars. Come on now. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. We hope you enjoyed season three of The Halal Gap. The Halal Gap is a Moscars production. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok by searching Moscars Film Festival. Thank you to our sound and video editor, Arish Jamil, our tile artist, Narmeen Sayed, and our producer, Asif Qureshi. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments about our podcast, you can email asif at themoscars.com. On behalf of Sikandar and myself, thank you to all our incredible guests this season and to all our wonderful listeners.